I don't think I've ever been closer than that. All right. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name's Joe Barnard, and that was echo landing test number four. So as you probably saw, it got really close. Um, it is super exciting to be this close to actually sticking it up right on the ground. So as always, I'm here today to tell you about what happened during the test, what's going on in the rocket, and how we can improve things uh, going forward. To get everyone up to speed here, this is the Echo Rocket. It is a purpose-built vehicle to be dropped from a UAV and tried to land propulsively. Um, it's about a kilogram in mass, it's about a meter tall, and uh, it's got a little flight computer, or a thrust vector control mount in the bottom, and some passive fins up top. The eventual goal here is to launch and land in the same flight, just like a SpaceX Falcon 9 or a Blue Origin New Shepard rocket. Um, you want to go up and come down in the same flight. So we have the Scout vehicle back there, that's to dial in the launching stuff, and we have the Echo vehicle here to dial in the landing stuff. And the idea is you can simplify a lot of these problems by just having two separate test programs. So you've got the landing program and the launching program, and eventually you, you put them together. <laughs> Before we get into the specifics of this flight, let's just talk generally about how this stuff works. So for these landing tests, what I do is I hook the rocket up to a UAV and I lift it up to about 30 meters above ground level. So as the rocket is going up, it's looking at all sorts of different sensor readings. It has an inertial measurement unit on board, which has a couple of gyroscopes and accelerometers. It also has a barometric pressure sensor to look for altitude. It has outputs for thrust vector control, it's data logging, it does basically everything. And when it detects that it's hit about 30 meters above ground level, it fires one of the pyro channels, which heats up a nichrome wire at the top of the rocket, which cuts the rubber band that connects the UAV and the rocket, separating the vehicles. As the rocket is falling, we want it to stay pretty close to upright. So I have these passive fins up top that are actually keeping it stable while it's not in powered flight. As a side note here, when we put the launching and landing programs together, these fins are gonna fold into the vehicle to keep things a little bit more aerodynamic on the way up. As it's falling, the flight computer is looking at measurements like altitude and velocity, and when it decides it's time to actually fire that motor, it brings it up to thrust and enables the thrust vector control system to actually keep the vehicle upright. Then, while the vehicle's under thrust, us, the landing legs pop out, and these are kind of deployed in the same way that we actually separate the rocket and the UAV. There's a little rubber band around the landing legs when they're folded in, and that rubber band gets cut by a little nichrome wire. One of the hardest parts about this is that there's no control over the thrust of the rocket. So this black powder solid propellant motor can't really be throttled. There are a couple of ways you can do it, but we don't have throttle control on this vehicle. So once that motor is lit, there is basically no turning back. The flight computer starts to just focus on thrust vector control, data logging, and keeping the vehicle from sliding side to side. Now that we have a general idea of the flight profile here, let's go back over that with the specifics of this test. At the launch site, I focus on following the SOP, or Standard Operating Procedure, and this is a set of instructions that I basically write myself to make sure that I know exactly what to do to calibrate all the sensors, to set up all the cameras, and follow all the right procedures to maintain consistent results between tests. One of the main differences between this test and the last one was a change in how the accelerometers in the vehicle are calibrated. During the last test, the accelerometer accelerometers were calibrated by using a level. This was prone to a little bit of inaccuracy, as we definitely saw with the results of the last test, so I changed the procedures to actually hang the rocket instead. By hanging the rocket, we can naturally find which direction is exactly upright by just using gravity. Um, so I hung the rocket, I let it reach equilibrium for heating on the power regulator, the CPU, and all these different things, at which point I calibrated the accelerometers. I mentioned this in a previous video, but I'm kind of reaching the limit for how accurate these little cell phone grade sensors can be. Um, if you're a company that, that makes more accurate inertial measurement units and you're interested in working together, hit me up. Seriously, I'm interested. Moving right along, after I started all the cameras, I lifted the vehicle up with the UAV. In the sensor readings here, we can see a nice smooth ascent with just a slight oscillation in pitch and yaw on the vehicle, but otherwise it was pretty stable. Once we passed 30 meters above ground level, the flight computer commanded the separation of the two vehicles. Now, the heating up that nichrome wire to actually break this rubber band takes a second, so we ended up separating around 31 or maybe 31 and a half meters above ground level. If you watched the last landing test video, you'll know that we have a lot of trouble getting accurate barometric altitude readings 
once the vehicle starts falling. So right at separation, we start those kinematic altitude measurements again. And these are basically physics-based simulations that are happening live on the flight computer as it predicts how it is actually going to fall in that ballistic arc. Another big change since the last test is that we have far more accurate orientation measurements on the vehicle now. As a quick primer, while the vehicle is being lifted up by that UAV, we're looking at acceleration measurements from the accelerometers to determine which way the vehicle is pointed. And this is really good over time because gravity doesn't really change that much, but the gyros can drift. However, the gyros are accurate in the short term. So once we drop from that drone, we switch over to the gyroscopes to actually determine orientation on the vehicle. This switchover happens because you can no longer trust those accelerometer measurements to determine orientation when you're in free fall or under thrust. Basically, the accelerometer looks for gravity, which way is gravity on all three axes. But if you're in free fall, when you sense no acceleration on the accelerometer, or if you're under thrust, when you're only sensing the thrust of the motor, those measurements aren't accurate. Anyway, so we switch over to the gyroscopes and all of this stuff is done using a quaternion measurement system. If you're interested in this, uh, Grant Sanderson from 3Blue1Brown has a fantastic video on this complicated subject that really breaks it down in a good way. Anyway, during the last landing test, I had an issue with renormalizing that flight orientation quaternion, which leads to nasty cross axis stuff and, and misalignment. So I fixed it and all of those big words resulted in a much better test this time. As the vehicle's falling down, we can see much better control with those fins than last time. Um, between the two tests, I lowered the center of mass just a little bit so that we can have a little bit more stability when we're actually touching down and stability during the unpowered portion of flight or the falling portion, and it seems to have worked. We also had great timing for ignition on the way down, and once again, this stuff is not hard-coded into the vehicle. I don't set a timer and I don't set an altitude for it to burn the motor. I tell the vehicle, here's what you should be looking at in terms of speed and altitude. Here's a little bit of math to do. Do it in flight and figure it out yourself. So <laughs> the rocket's making most of the decisions in flight and it chose pretty well for burning that motor at the right time. Um, a lot of this is also due to the switch over to that physics-based approach instead of looking at the altitude measurements directly. Something that's been raised as a concern a few times with this type of testing is the performance of the motor and the consistency you can get between different motors, different propellant batches, things like that. What this basically means is, let's say your motor is supposed to burn at 10 newtons. That's what the manufacturer provides. What happens when you burn it and it actually burns at like 11 newtons or maybe nine newtons? If it, if it overperforms or underperforms, that would be a deviation from the spec. So the general consensus in model rocketry is that you should expect about a 5% deviation for most motors. However, I've done testing on this with my buddy Johnny, and we found that for this specific motor, it's the Estes F15, if you're curious, we found the results to be way closer to like one or 2% between motors. So the general concern for a lack of consistency between motors is well-founded, but actually not that big of a problem here. Um, the bigger problem is ignition timing. I'm using these fireworks igniters, which every now and then will have a slow or fast ignition in comparison to their others. They have a pretty wide standard deviation. So right now, finding better igniters is, is somewhat of a priority. Moving on here, after the retro motor is ignited by the flight computer, the thrust vector control system turns on. So we start gimbling the motor at the bottom of the rocket and pointing it in different directions to try to keep it pointed upright. And it's actually, that's kind of a lie. We're not actually targeting directly upright the whole time. We have all of this new horizontal control software that I put on the flight computer um, that did not work very well last time, but worked super, super well for this test. As a quick recap, the way this works is as the vehicle is falling, we're probably going to be biased to one side or the other. It's going to just naturally tend toward one direction or the other, and it's gonna slide in that direction. So the flight computer tracks the horizontal movement of the rocket and let's say it's sliding this direction. What we do is we actually pitch the rocket over just a little bit to null out that horizontal velocity. And you can see in this test, it works super, super well, far better than previous tests. Here are a few clips from some older landing tests in which you can see a pretty severe slide to the side because we don't have that horizontal control software actually working at that point. You'll have to forgive the quality of this next shot because my budget is limited and I can only afford so many nice cameras, but this is from the recent landing test. It is the off-axis long-range camera, and it doesn't, it doesn't slide to the side at all. It's like locked in horizontally. I cannot, I can't even be professional about it. I just, it's so exciting. <laughs> Thank you.
Now you'll notice that this isn't the case for every single camera angle. For instance, in this other long range shot, you can see a little bit of a slide on touchdown. I would love to blame an error like this on the wind or something that I can't control, um, but the truth is there was basically no wind on that day. I intentionally test on days with very low wind so we don't have to deal with error sources like that. You can see in this longer range shot, even after the test, the smoke hangs around for quite a while. That said, I do think I know where the error is coming from here. Let's back up into the flight just a couple of seconds to where the legs deploy and look at some of that onboard footage. That's a pretty serious vibration on the vehicle when those legs fold out, and we can definitely see this on the acceleration measurements. But we can also see this high shock event on the gyroscope measurements too. If we look in the flight data, there's this massive spike on the x-axis. What this big shock on the vehicle equates to is a very small version of what we had happen during the last test, where the vehicle basically thinks it's pointed just a little bit off where it actually is. It's just slightly wrong on which way is upright. And a tiny little error like that is gonna result in a tiny little guidance error, which equates to why the vehicle was still moving to the side on touchdown. As with almost everything, there are a lot of ways you could go about fixing this, but the way that I'll probably choose is by filtering those gyroscope measurements just a little bit further and putting some control logic in there to protect from big shocks and spikes on the vehicle. I can also sort of reduce the uh, aggressiveness of those landing legs too. So the last part of this flight is where the vehicle hovers just about 10 centimeters off the ground. And if we're being honest, it's probably closer to like 12 or 13 centimeters, but who's counting? The LiDAR, the LiDAR is counting. <laughs> There's no LiDAR on this vehicle, but like, mm, stay tuned. Anyway, we hover just about 10 centimeters off the ground and then we drop. So this is the part of the video where I just want to manage expectations a little bit. Um, hovering 10 centimeters off the ground after dropping from 30 meters is kind of insane and it's going to be hard to repeat that every single time. Um, based on these physics-based altitude measurements and a bunch of other factors, um, I can get pretty close to that every time and we should see that over the course of the next few landing tests, but it may not be that good every time. So there's an amount of luck here that's involved. And also I think that's okay. I mean, these are model rockets, like you can't take it too seriously. There is one thing that I'm thinking about implementing just a few tests down the road, and that is, um, I'm gonna call it cosine throttling, but I don't actually know if there's a name for it. Um, essentially, I know where I want to point the thrust vector control mount, but near the end of the flight, if we need to bleed off a little bit of power from our retro motor, I could basically gimbal it back and forth very fast um, surrounding that set point so that we bleed off just a little bit of power. I don't know. It's gonna be difficult to make that work, but it's just something that might be an option in the future. Finally here, we see a decent amount of bounce on the grass before the vehicle tips over. And so for the tipping over, I think there are basically two main factors. The first and foremost is that horizontal speed, but the second is that I do think the bounce contributes a little bit to um, are tipping over. So these 3D printed legs here are made of PLA or polylactic acid. Um, they exhibit a phenomenon known in the scientific community as a bit of a boing factor. Um, this is a serious scientific term. The main problem here is that when the vehicle touches down, it's putting a decent amount of energy into these legs and the springiness of them is returning that energy pretty directly back into the system or back into the rocket, so it bounces back up. One of the ways that the Falcon 9 deals with this is something called a crush core in the landing leg struts, and this is a bit of honeycomb aluminum material that when the vehicle touches down just a little bit too hard, the energy of that impact is absorbed by crushing this aluminum a little bit. You can actually see it on some of the boosters that have harder landings where they lean a little bit. One of the other ways I could probably fix this since I'm landing on grass is I could put spikes in the landing legs or sort of nails that stick out so when the vehicle touches down, it goes like chunk. I really wanna avoid doing this. I'm super against the idea of having a rocket falling out of the sky with nails pointed toward the ground. The last way you could fix this too is by printing longer landing legs so you have a wider base when the vehicle touches down. I would rather not go with this approach and instead just try to fix it in software. Um, generally speaking, a lot of the hardware uh, solutions for these problems are kind of shortcuts to just fixing it in software. Now I do want to take a moment to acknowledge a pretty serious range safety violation that we had. Um, after the vehicle touched down on the ground, um, a member of the operation team approached the vehicle far too soon. Um, and this is a pretty serious issue, so I, you know, I won't let it happen again. All right, all jokes aside, let's talk about what's coming up before the next landing test, like what's gonna change in the future here. So first we need to fix 
or at least deal with the leg deployment vibration issue. Um, again, I want to fix this in software, not in hardware. So it's just better filtering on those gyro values um, and I think maybe a little bit later with the leg deployment. Also, this might be a little bit counterintuitive, but I actually wanna raise the height at which the retro burn starts. So I want the vehicle to start burning that motor a little bit earlier so it can hover a little higher off the ground. Um, and the intention isn't actually to hover that much higher. I just wanna make sure we have a decent amount of margin so that we don't touch the vehicle down too early. Having it drop after burnout is far preferable to having it touch the ground while the motor is burning, because at that point, the thrust vector control system doesn't have control anymore, and we risk uh, a lot of instability when the vehicle touches the grass. And finally, after about one to three more tests on the Echo vehicle, we're gonna retire this guy right here and move over to the Scout vehicle for landing tests, because at that point, we'll be doing launch and landing in the same flight. So if you want more details on all this stuff, I can't recommend highly enough that you follow one or more of the social media channels for BPS. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, stay posted there because there might or might not be a landing leg giveaway coming up very soon. Also, this is the part of the video where I plug the Patreon page, um, but I would love to get some better cameras to film these tests. I mean, some of this footage is just kind of garbage looking. Um, if you're interested, please consider supporting bps.space on Patreon. There is no requirement to do it, but I put all the money from that back into the project so we can invest in better cameras, better test equipment, all of that stuff. Anyway, thanks to those folks who support. Thank you for you. Thank you to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your wind be low.